Hazel School and its higher degree, it was 40 below zero. I don't remember that. I blocked it out. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to our third Thursday lunchtime lecture. Um, and two things. First of all, we are going out on Facebook Live again. So we are live. Oh, is that what that is? Yes. Oh, God. And um, we have our second speaker for 2019, Brian Knight. Brian Knight's been in and out of the North Shire since the early 1980s, uh, more permanently since 2003. He's been doing historic preservation work around the state uh, from Burlington and Williston to Brandon and Manchester. Um, he's been a curator at Hildeen in Manchester. He's also been a history teacher at Stratton Mountain School. And right now he's primarily a historic preservation consultant for the uh, National Register nominations. He's written another book on the Equinox Guards that came out, what, 10 years ago? Yeah, uh, 14, and, 14. <laughs> yeah, time flies, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And right now, he has written a book on the uh, history of snowboarding in southern Vermont. Brian is a snowboarder, but he feels detached enough that he can write a good history about it. <laughs> so please welcome Brian Knight. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, when I, uh, when I, I've been exposed to snowboarding since the early 80s first started to being developed, uh, started getting popularity. And uh, as an objector of the observer of snowboarding, I wasn't really uh, going out there uh, with full gusto. I just did it in my backyard. Uh, but I just, all my friends were uh, doing it, and they were going through that process of when it was first starting to get accepted on the mountains. And then I worked at Stratton throughout the uh, 80s and 90s, so I was able to observe the sport from there. As well, I wrote for a music magazine uh, in the 90s that I covered a lot of snowboarding events as well. And then I was a history teacher, teacher at Stratton Mountain School. And it was then when I was uh, sitting along with the coaches at, uh, at Stratton Mountain School, people like Ross Powers and other coaches, and we just had conversations every day. And through those conversations, I kind of just realized, wow, I've... Uh, I've sort of seen this all, and I know a lot of the people who were key players in it. And I decided that I think I should write a book. I had a good idea of what a beginning would be for the book, but I didn't have a good idea for an end. Uh, I didn't have a, a bookend to it. And once the U.S. Open picked up and went from Stratton out to Vail, Colorado, I, it finally came to me. I have sort of a, a nice beginning and end for the story. So that really would have, that prompted me to. Uh, to write the book. And one of my first goals right away when I started writing the book is I couldn't do a general history. Like I did, there's too much information. Uh, there's a lot of debate on uh, where it really started. Uh, 14th century Turkey, they had sort of this stick with a rope and a sort of a steering uh, pole. Uh, there's a patent in 1939 for a similar device. Uh, 1968, this is the product that really sort of influenced a lot of the future snowboard makers, and that was the Snurfer, which was made by a gentleman in uh, Michigan. And uh, a lot of these units were sold, over a million. It was uh, handled by the Brunswick Company, which also did pool tables. And uh, so many of the early snowboarders harken back to, yeah, I had a snurfer for Christmas, and that's what really exposed myself. And that's exactly what Jake Burton Carpenter got. He was up at Bromley in the 60s, and he received a uh, snurfer for, uh, for a Christmas gift, and that really sort of ignited his passion. But I, I stayed away from the general history. I, and then it gets even stickier on who really is the father, or who is the original snowboard company in America. It was sort of this simultaneous event. Uh, Jake Burton was doing, Carpenter was doing it here in the East Coast. You had Sim, whoops, Sims snowboards out on the West Coast, winter stick snowboards, barfoot snowboards, uh, all happening s simultaneously. And everybody has sort of their claim. Uh, I built my first board in 68. I built my first board in 70 or whatever. I'm making up those numbers. but. I really didn't even want to touch that either, just because I didn't. I just 
wanted to keep it sort of simple. So I focused on what this community, this extended community, uh, what was their contributions to this sport. And I really, even after writing the book about the Equinox Guards and the Civil War, I feel like this is another installment. It's a local history. It's uh, focusing on this general community. Uh, this story begins with uh, Jake Bird Carpenter. He was an alpine skier. Just about everyone in these early days was an alpine skier. Uh, they all were basically bored with the sport and uh, felt that uh, there's something more exciting out there. So he was uh, at school out in Colorado. He was on his way to a Grateful Dead concert and the car crashed and he broke his collarbone. Uh, so that really brought an end to his his skiing career. Uh, he returned to the East Coast, went to New York University, studied economics, uh, was uh, dealing with a lot of uh, small businesses, small manufacturing companies while working as an intern on Wall Street. And he really sort of uh, discovered that he could probably get involved in this manufacturing type of business. Uh, he had a small, a, a good inheritance of about $100,000 from the death of his mother. So he used that money came up to Londonderry, uh, started a small little business uh, in Londonderry, uh, the building's no longer around, and started <coughs> developing boards, and uh, had his own little wood workshop. Uh, he also used Emo Heinrich's wood shop up at uh, the Birkin House up at Stratton. Uh, a lot of trial and error, a lot of reports of running boards through these different uh, wood making devices and them catapulting out and getting impaled in the walls and a lot of trial and error. Uh, he, at that time, he also had his, uh, there's three employees, both relatives, that's how small an operation was, but one of them did design the, the first logo, a logo that's still used today. And what happened is uh, he burnt through all the money and was con considered a, a failure, really. Uh, and so he had to retreat. He went back to Long Island and taught tennis and, uh, and hung out on the beach and sort of tried to regroup and reevaluate what, uh, what he needed to do. And what he really discovered is that he had this great product. He didn't have an audience. He, he, the sport hadn't developed enough to have people go out and buy it. And there wasn't a, a sort of a, a groundswell, a critical mass, anything of that matter, to, uh, to have interest in the sport. So when he, he came back up to Vermont with this new sort of vision and uh, goal, and that was to raise awareness about this great sport so he would have some people to sell his product to. Uh, and that is something that he continued throughout the 80s, 90s, he really he became an ambassador of the sport, really. And uh, was, although making money and building his company was a goal, but he really looked out over the, the sport as in general. One of the first uh, sort of events that put snowboarding on the map was up in Woodstock in Suicide Six. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Paul Graves. Uh, put on the National Snow Surfing Championship, was, which was part of the Winter Carnival up at, uh, at Woodstock. And uh, basically, not really the snowboard that you think of today, really kind of a variation of the snurfer, flat board, rope, maybe something resembling like a water skiing binding, you just stick your feet in, uh, no different boots or anything of that matter. And, uh, and here's a picture of the Burke team uh, that year, and it's, uh, you know, they're just in regular clothes, jeans, gaiters, uh, regular coats, uh, just a bunch of guys really having fun, and girls. And uh, also, the starting gate is a kitchen table turned upside down, buried in snow, because all snowboarders have to sort of pull themselves out of the starting gate. So they didn't even really have a, a, a real starting gate as they uh, know it today. Uh, a gentleman that was uh, an early champion who won that event, and from Dorset, Doug Booten. And uh, he was uh, known for his skateboarding style and really uh, one of the first icons of the sport. And, uh, but he sort of drops off from the scene in the early 80s. So he's just one of those people that was there 
right at the beginning. And this is a, uh, Jake will take the event from Mount Snow and he'll move it to Snow Valley. And uh, he'll uh, label it his own event. And this is just a letter from, uh, from 1983 that he sent out to the competitors uh, telling about registration and what kind of event it was. But uh, I'm really drawn to the final paragraph here. And it says, this year Burton Snowboards is sponsoring the Nationals. And as president of Burton Corporation, I personally requ request that all competitors and their friends remember that Snow Valley is doing us an enormous favor in allowing us to compete on their slopes. Our conduct must be above reproach. We must all treat the management of the area and other skiers with utmost respect, as underlined and capitalized. If you cause a problem, you will hurt yourself by elimination from the event. And more importantly, you'll be hurting our sport. Uh, so this is 1983, when there's not really many people doing this, but he has this vision, like if we're going to get accepted as a sport, we need to be on our best behavior. And... Uh, over the years, we'll find that not everyone followed that uh, credo, but uh, he tried his hardest. So in Snow Valley uh, was events held in 1983 and 1984, uh, much larger, huge contingents from California. At this time, Michigan was a, was a hotbed of uh, snow surfing, as it was called at the time. And uh, really a lot different than how we see snowboarding today. You know? No flipping through the half pipes, no tricks. Everyone stayed on the ground. Oh, well, they tried to stay on the ground. And it was really straight down, who could survive, who could go about wiping out, and uh, maybe some gates. Uh, hey, Brian, walk up. Yes? I have a question. Snow Valley, where yes. was that? That's if you uh, go up to towards where the Kandahar was, where the, uh, the little food place is at the mm -hmm. junction of 11 and 30. When you take a right. And then it's up, up on your right. So it's a local ski area that's not there anymore. Yeah, okay. it's, uh, you can see Old Snow Valley Road off 30, like right after when you come up from Mistral's and take a left on 30. Mm -hmm. A little further up on the right, there's the old access road, and you can see all these old A-frames up there uh, that just sort of reflect the early development around the ski area. And you can st people still go up there and uh, hike it and ski and snowboard, and the the remains of the uh, Base lodge are still there, burnt. I don't know what it burnt, but they tried to resuscitate it some years ago, and it, as I understand, it didn't work. Yeah, no. There's been lots of different uh, attempts. Uh, no snow. They didn't. You weren't allowed to uh, ride the lift, so you had to hike up to do your run. Uh, and as I understand, nobody made it from top to bottom with point pointing out. So it, was, uh, it wasn't really, it was really the fastest time, but it was the fastest time you wiped out, you got back on, you went down a little bit, wiped out, got back on, and then eventually got over the finish line. So it was still the fastest time, but there wasn't any clean runs. It was uh, characterized by a lot of, uh, of wipeouts. And this is a, a poster from the 1984 contest in Snow Valley, which uh, all the participants signed. Uh, and after that event, after both events, uh, all the competitors camped out in the base lodge. They brought their uh, sleeping bags and uh, probably a couple of keg beers, and they spent the whole night just having fun and uh, skateboarding through the lodge and uh, just a really sort of low-key grassroots event, really. Where is that poster? That is from the Burton Archives. And that, that's... Jake Burton Carpenter's personal one. I've seen some other ones here and there, but you know, definitely a, uh, a photocopied piece of paper from 1984. It's definitely one of the things that doesn't survive a lot of spring cleanings, really. So mm -hmm. you know, not too many of them out there. So when Jake does come back to Vermont, he doesn't use uh, London Dairy as his base of operations. He moves down to Manchester. This, he has a house right on 7A, basically across the street from the Vermont Country Store in that vicinity. This is a picture taken this past summer. You can still see uh, the barn out back. And this was, uh, this is the factory. And this is a, this is a 
basically a to-do list and an inventory of making snowboards in the early 80s. And you had everything you needed, uh, urethane, paint, staples, razors, mat. Uh, you had all the things you had to do. You had the draw, you had the back saw, you had the drill binding holes, you had the routes, you had the edge, uh, you had the dip. Uh, so many different things. And uh, that's basically <laughs> what all his employees, who were basically Burton, Burn Burton high school kids who were working in the summer and uh, a lot of them worked there in the summer and never even snowboarded until the following winter. Uh, they didn't really know what they were uh, getting into. Uh, some great pictures from the early 80s in, uh, in, in the shop. And one of, there's two things. The worst job, if you're on Jake's bad side, if you showed up late, or if you're uh, being a bit of a slacker, you had to grind the fins, which I guess you had sort of a, some kind of grinder or sand, not a sandpaper because it was metal, but you had to work on the fins because back then the snowboards didn't have metal edges. They had these skegs, these fins that stuck down because it was really just for powder. It wasn't designed for uh, going on packed snow. So we're a long way from things that resembled a ski. Uh, so that, if you were bad or unproductive, you had to grind fins. Uh, but one of the worst jobs, really, was <coughs> dipping the board. Uh, the, the, one of the final steps was taking the board and coating it in polyurethane. And they had these long poles, and they'd grab it by the top, the snowboard, and they'd dip it in this big vat of polyurethane and uh, hang them up on a rack, like you're seeing right there. Uh, you had to wear a respirator, you were in a sealed room. Uh, you had a, your mask was attached to an oxygen pump like outside the room. Uh, most reports that I get from these early workers is, is kind of like the equivalent of sniffing glue. Uh, so uh, Jake took it upon himself that he didn't want his uh, employees uh, handling any machinery after doing the dipping process. So they all had like a mandatory timeout on this front lawn before they were allowed to go home or do anything because uh, because of the, uh, I don't know if the right word, but the intoxicating effects of, uh, of that job. And at this time, we're not on the ski areas. So most of the snowboarding was done in back hills, uh, golf courses. So they would go over to the Equinox Golf Course and uh, hit some hills there. Uh, other popular sp spots were if you go up Canterbury Lane and uh, that road off of Canterbury Lane where people watch the fireworks. You could go down that hill towards the Vermont Country Store. They do that all the time. Uh, back when seven, Route 7 was being built, there was a huge sand pit up on the road where they were getting their dirt and was sort of like a construction st staging zone. And there was huge banks that they could go up there and do it. Uh, then they got a little more aggressive and they would uh, take, they'd go up to Bromley and they'd all pile in a, uh, in a car, a Volare to be exact. And one person would be the designated driver and they would drive up to the condos at Bromley, drop everyone off. And uh, they would go down Lord's Prayer or Plaza, the trails at Bromley, and then they would meet them down at the bottom and switch drivers and just do runs uh, up and down Bromley after hours. Uh, they eventually got a little more creative. Uh, Donna Carpenter, who was Jake's wife, uh, started making brownies that they'd give to the, the groomers to get a free ride up. Uh, they would actually figure out how they could get in front of the groomers and take advantage of the lights of the groomers for a little while until they got going too fast and they were doing it in the dark, long before headlamps or anything like that. But the real goal is to get on one of these, the chairlift. Uh, this is uh, part of Jake's vision, to get accepted by ski areas, not to be treated like a toy. Uh, you know, a lot of ski areas are, uh, equated snowboarding to like grabbing a tray from the cafeteria and going down. Uh, they didn't see it as a sport, but just sort of, <coughs> sort of a, an activity that like sledding or something. So getting up on those lifts was a real early goal. And this guy right here, Paul Johnson, local, he was VP of uh, operations at Stratton at the time. Uh, Jake and some of his employees go up to uh, Stratton. They're doing this at a lot of different areas. They're asking a lot of areas, but they finally sort of get their foot in the door at Stratton. And uh, they have a demonstration day. They go up there. They uh, show how you can stop and turn, turn left, turn right, get on a lift. 
Uh, then they actually have some of the ski patrol members do it, and some other people up at Stratton within the administration do it. And uh, there's a lot of opposition from the Stratton Board of Directors, but Paul Johnson uh, convinces them to try a trial period. Of, uh, I don't know how long a trial period it was, but let's, let's try this and see if it can work. Uh, luckily, the day that they went up there to show the sport, it was like a really nice day, the so snow was really soft, and uh, so all these people have never done it before, got them on and tried it, and it was kind of easy. Uh, you know, if it was a typical frozen, icy day, <laughs> who knows where it would be today. Because uh, uh, a, a big part of my learning how to snowboard is spending a lot of time on your butt. Uh, just falling down, and ice is definitely not your best friend. So they have this trial period, and the trial period involves Burton being responsible for certifying all the snowboarders. Um, the Stratton wasn't in charge of it, so Burton would send up employees, and they would have a, a ski school program, but it was really just one guy. And that guy is Mark Kindgartner, uh, another uh, local family, and uh, you had to get through him to get on a chairlift. And uh, just about everyone I... Uh, interviewed, uh, you know, said that he would sit there and make him take, you'd have to hike up and go down, hike up and go down, and demonstrate that you could turn and stop and get on the lift and all that, uh, all that stuff. And uh, it was not an easy process, because at the same time, you didn't want these people up there <coughs> wiping out and taking out skiers and causing trouble. So there's still this vision of, like, we need to make sure that we have competent people up there, or at least semi-competent people, up there on the slopes trying this. Which, you know, Paul Johnson years later, or not even years later, found that funny because you know, all these snowboarders had to go through this very rigorous process to be allowed on the mountain, but anyone could go up there and throw on skis and really do just as much damage. So there was sort of an inequality there. Uh, and this was what you wanted. <laughs> you wanted a little sticker on the back of your pass that allowed you on the lower mountain, and then if you were really good, you got to the upper mountain. And uh, that, was, that was the goal. Uh, Trisha Burns will eventually go to the 2002 Olympics and uh, mm -hmm. has her start. Uh, She's so young there. What year is that taken? That's early 80s. Wow. Um, I mean, I remember these two, when I was up there every morning, every weekend, in the base lodge, you know, putting on my ski boots and they'd be putting on their snowboard equipment. They were, they were fixtures there every weekend. Uh, and you had to deal with, uh, oh with this. This is from uh, 1988, Time Magazine. Worst new sports. Snowboarding, to, to traditionalists, the breezy fat is a clumsy intrusion on the sleek precision of downhill skiing. But to some 100,000 enthusiasts, many of them adolescent males, it is the coolest snow sport of the season. Of course, there are holdouts. Complains veteran Vermont skier Mary Simon, snowboarding is not about grace and style, but about raging hormones. Oh. <laughs> remember when they just took cold showers, is sort of the byline there. So this, this is the opposition you, you, they were facing, really. Uh, in 1992, Time Magazine voted lawnmower racing as the worst sport. So uh, this snowboarding had a little more uh, success than lawnmower. And this opposition was reflected on the mountains. This is Tamarack, a great trail up at Stratton. And I had this sign right here, Alpine skiing only, no snowboard skiing, please. So also, snowboard skiing, not, a, not really even a word. Uh, this is how new the sport is. They're still sort of trying to figure out what it was called. And uh, so th this is sort of response to the, uh, the homeowners and the people who still didn't know what this, uh, this sport was. They had their own private trail. Uh, the great thing about doing research is you have this picture, and then just people bring you new pictures. And uh, this is the same thing, and those are all middle fingers there by snowboarders. So uh, <laughs> I think that's a good example of maybe some of the people not following Jake's credo of uh, treating oh. people with respect, maybe. Um, also, the ski patrol had some initial opposition, too. Uh, they did have more injuries, a lot of upper body injuries that they had to deal with. But what the ski patrol really hated was the snowboarders taking uh, their private trails that they cut out in the woods in the summer. 
and uh, they, they really hated the snowboarders going in there and the common misperception or even maybe an accurate perception is that snowboarders just sort of slide down and push all the snow away. And so the ski patrol did not like the fact that this was happening to their back trails. Uh, so they actually like, would cut like fake trails in and sort of false trails, you know, tried to uh, sort of uh, misguide the snowboarders from their own uh, private little areas. And now, like, ironically, those private areas are now glades, uh, which are now on the trail map, tree skiing, tree snowboarding. And it, you really have to credit snowboarding for a lot, like creating this new interest in tree skiing. Because in 1977, there was a uh, court case. A, a man by the name of James Sunday hurt himself up at Stratton, uh, hit a root or a tree or something of that matter, uh, was paralyzed, sued Stratton, and sort of the after effect of that lawsuit was that ski areas, if there was anything that resembled a jump or a little side trail off into the woods, they put about as much bamboo in front of it so you couldn't go down it. So it was. Uh, Skiing, and this is early 80s, was uh, you're sort of relegated to the trails. It wasn't really promoting uh, jumping or anything uh, that you see today. So Stratton Mountain School will uh, serve as a sort of a feeding ground for some of these early snowboarders, all skiers. Stratton Mountain School did not have a ski program at this time. Uh, but a lot of uh, those skiers would spend their weekends snowboarding and were getting good at it and uh, would compete on the weekends. Uh, Tara Eberhard and Steve Hayes were both uh, home, uh, from Connecticut but were at Stratton Mountain School. The Hayes family had a house uh, right at the base of Stratton. And uh, Steve Hayes was actually getting really, really good joining the Burton team, but Str Stratton Mountain School didn't know what to do with them. Like, we don't have coaches. We can't just send you up to the mountain on your own. We don't know how to train you. Uh, it's just sort of this unknown factor. Uh, so he actually had to sign a document saying, I'm going to ski only. I'm not snowboard. And eventually Stratton changed their ways and said, well, you, you have a future in this. So it would be silly for us to make you ski when you can go snowboarding. A document by a teenager legal? I, I haven't seen this document, and uh, you also got to take some of these stories with a little bit of a uh, grain of salt as well. Uh, so the Hayes brothers uh, will be the first people certified on the upper mountain, the first ones that are allowed to go to the top. And, uh, they, they become legends up there. They're, they're practically mythical. Uh, both will join the Burton team. They'll, Steve will get on the cover of... Uh, the Burton catalog, Mike's on the inset, and these two will, uh, I mean, everyone knew them. They are definitely sort of the legends of the early Stratton Mountain snowboarding scene to such a degree that they go out west and uh, they snowboard the dunes uh, for a, uh, a Swatch commercial, which I haven't found that Swatch commercial yet. Uh, Tara Eberhard, who I showed before, will become sort of the... Uh, Hubert Schreibel's uh, favorite photograph. Uh, she, she's very photogenic, as you can see, but will become a, a rated uh, race skier. Alpine, I use the term alpine skier, that means alpine snowboarder, that means you're going through the gates. Um, and we'll see soon enough that that's going to change. Alpine snowboarding is not it's fairly visible today. Susie Ruick was also a Stratton Mountain uh, alum, is a Stratton Mountain alum, and she. Uh, she will eventually start the Allegro program up at Stratton, which was a, a, a sort of an educational program for a lot of young snowboarders, which will breed a lot of future uh, competitors. This is, uh, I don't know if it's GIST, I think it's Bromley Outing Club, uh, late 70s. Uh, in that picture are a lot of snowboarders who will rise to great ranks. Andy Coughlin will be a U.S. Open champion multiple times. He's everywhere in snowboarding history. Call him the Zellig of snowboarding history. He'll own a snowboard shop up in Burlington. He's a coach. Uh, he coaches uh, the, the fundraising basketball teams that they hold that I'll get to in a bit. Uh, he's everywhere. And 
and uh, really is uh, one of the, the fathers of the sport. Betsy Shaw, another uh, Manchester area local. She starts with uh, the outing, well, she starts with GIS, excuse me, and then outing club. Goes to races for BBA, BBS at the time, and uh, will go to UNH and be a uh, ski racer up there. And come, she comes to the US Open at Stratton, sees these girls having fun, you know, they're wearing, uh, like, I don't even know what the right word is, but like very <laughs> little clothing while they're competing, not like all these body suits and stuff that they wear today. And just saw that these girls were having such great fun. And she's like, I want to do that. And uh, she starts doing it, comes very good, and realizes this is a great way to make money on the weekend while I'm at school. And uh, she will go off to join a world tour and uh, becomes an internationally ranked snowboarder. And goes to the Olympics. And goes to the Olympics in 1998. Scott Palmer, another Dorset resident, uh, he will become a racer as well. He's up at Johnson doing skiing and he makes the switch, becomes a coach of the Carabasset Valley school and then will become the first teacher at Stratton Mountain School in the 90s and will be the first coach and will coach Ross Powers. So allowed on the mountain I mean allowed on the mountains will really spark growth in the sport and the back barn on Route 7A is not going to really uh, work anymore as a factory. So Burton moves to the industrial <coughs> park just down the road. And there it becomes, it grows exponentially. Hiring people and producing lots of different boards, different models, uh, always facing challenges of uh, meeting the demand. Uh, so many of the stories involve uh, the people upstairs, which is the administrative offices, sales and what have you, having to come downstairs and drill holes in boards and get these boards out and make these orders because the demand was just uh, beyond they could handle year to year. And two, uh, the racing program will take off up at Stratton. Susie Ruick and Mark Heingartner, uh, both uh, locals, uh, will take control of the Allegro program, which is this sort of weekend program. Gets uh, kids snowboarding together, they'll run gates. Uh, they start the Green Mountain Series, which is a race series up and down the state giving all these kids an opportunity to uh, compete and really gives the, the sport some uh, a groundswell in terms of uh, organization and uh, racing, really. And the Green Mountain Series, uh, we have an event every weekend, and uh, within these pictures are a lot of uh, future pro riders, but they would just kind of come up on weekends with their families and uh, do this all week. Uh, really, once again, really a lot of people filtering through this program. Eventually, Stratton is going to take over the educational component of it. Uh, the, the Burton doesn't have to do the certification. They don't have to use their own employees. Stratton's going to take it over. Uh, and there's going to be some, uh, some, some development issues there in terms of uh, the, the snowboarders and the skiers within the, uh, the school. Uh, for one, uh, the snow ski school demanded that they wear the same outfits as the ski school instructors, which uh, were sort of tight-fitting pants and, and tight-fitting sweaters and snowboarders. They need jackets that go down further over the butt. They need reinforced knees. They just need different equipment. And so the, the fact that they had to wear the same outfits as the, the ski instructors was a little difficult. Uh, and also the identity wasn't really sort of the the red shirt with the black eagle with uh, you know, the boat in her pants. It just wasn't part of the, uh, the snowboarder's identity. And another tricky thing was lineup. When you, when you go to take a ski lesson at Stratton, you go meet your instructor, and all the instructors are lined up nice and uniformly together. And the snowboarders, they can't line up with their legs like this. You know, they have to line up like this. And it was just very awkward to try to sort of integrate the two. Uh, and over time, the snowboarding school is really going to get its auto autonomy in terms of uh, their own meeting area, their own uniforms, and things like that. And didn't, didn't try to sort of integrate it with uh, skiing at the time. And there's a picture of the, uh, the, ski, the ski school at the time. 
very strong Austrian influence at this new school. <laughs> but what's really going to change the sport isn't going to happen here. It's going to happen out in California at a uh, Lake Tahoe town dump. And uh, all these snowboarders out there, they grew up ski skating in uh, pools during the summer. And they're like, we want to do this in the winter. And so they figured out if they could find some hills or some banks, uh, they can go down one side and go up and hit it and do something in the air and come back down. And uh, the half pipe. And that's really going to uh, change the sport quite a bit. Uh, at this time, the East Coasters are still have this alpine sort of identity. They have the downhill suits and they're into the gates doing the racing. Uh, in those early years, when the East Coast snowboarders went out west and they saw this half pipe, I mean, they threatened to boycott. Like, we're not doing that. We're not going in there. And also, when the West Coast was <coughs> the East Coast, they're like, what are these gates? We're not going to go through these gates. Uh, so it took a while for even the two uh, coasts to uh, sort of come together. So the half pipe is going to take off, and Stratton is going to work on making a half pipe. Their first shot at it is actually cutting the half pipe in the land during the summer. Which, and then they would just fill it with snow in the winter. But that did prove to be very bad because in the spring, all you had was a big thing of mud in the middle. <laughs> it didn't work. So they, had, they figured it out and they realized you had to blow lots of snow and then carve the pipe out of the snow. But that was even tough because you had this big pile of snow and you had shovels and picks and cutting out a half pipe out of a big pile of ice uh, wasn't going to work. So Paul Johnson called uh, David Shaves, uh, I believe in Londonderry, and he lent him Lyle Blaisdell, who came up with his, uh, his excavator and cut the first pipes. And I, I can somewhat safely say that Lyle Blaisdell is probably the most famous excavator driver in America at this time. Like, all the snowboarders know Lyle Blaisdell, Lyle Blaisdell. Like, he's legendary within the ranks. And he got pretty creative with it. He did some uh, changes to the bucket, so it made a nice smooth transition. And uh, uh, this was, uh, now you have these things. They're called pipe dragons. And they are these massive machines that just go down and cut them. Uh, so it's, this is really uh, a common theme in this story, is just people improv, you know, figuring it out as you go. There's really no rules uh, or even anything established in terms of how we're going to do the snowboarding. Everything from judging to designing boards to, uh, to making half pipes, uh, sort of making it up as you go. Stratton will have the first half pipe competition in 1988. Uh, back then they had moguls, slalom, half pipe, and downhill. Uh, moguls is long gone. Uh, doing a moguls on a snowboard is a fun experience. <laughs> and with that, you're going to have uh, sort of this influx of style, too. The, the, the skateboarding influence of the West Coast is going to come to the East Coast. You're going to have some crazy colors, some crazy characters. Uh, definitely sort of the conservative East Coast Alpine skiing influence is going to get kicked to the curb. And you're going to have more of this wild sort of skateboarding image that's going to take over. And you're also going to have the poster boys and girls of Burton are going to go from the Alpine skiers, a lot of the Vermonters, you know, Hayes, Eberhard, Coughlin, and Heingartner, who were on the cover of every catalog and were on the posters. And it's going to switch over to the people who are going to be getting there, like Craig Kelly, who's from the West Coast. So he's a legend within the sport. So the marketing is going to change as well. You're also going to have a lot of local people from around here, the general southern Vermont area, who are going to migrate to Stratton for this half pipe. This half pipe will become legendary. It will be known as the best half pipe on the East Coast. Uh, Jason Ford from Pownall, Seth Neary and Seth Miller from Chittenden County, Jason Goldsmith from Brattleboro, uh, they're all going to become pro riders, but they're going to spend their winters at Stratton hiking the pipe and uh, going up and down. Uh, there was a challenge in the early days because you had to have a season's pass to climb to hike the pipe. And, uh, <laughs> these kids did not like that, so they would uh, park up on North Brookwood Avenue Road and sort of sneak <laughs> in. 
and uh, they would hike the pipe, and then when the ticket checkers would come up, they'd see them coming up one side of the pipe, so they would just all go down and get onto the other side of the pipe and sort of wave at the ticket checker like, you can't catch me. And uh, Stratton finally realized we just need to create a half pipe ticket, so we could just go up there and hike the pipe. We're not riding lifts or anything like that, so that really allowed a lot of younger kids to take advantage of the sport. Kobe Chittenden, also from Londonderry now, uh, he was uh, from upstate New York, came, uh, came over for a U.S. Open competition to watch it, loved the sport, stayed here, and became a ranked rider. But it's also, even though this is a local history, the U.S. Open will become just known for these, it was the end of the season, People felt really comfortable here. The competitors felt comfortable. It was sort of this time when everyone pushed to, to the limit in terms of uh, the moves they were doing. Uh, so it becomes this, the event of the year. And people like Terje Hawkinson from Norway, and Todd Richards from New Hampshire, and Craig Kelly from Washington, and Jeff Brushy from uh, Northern Vermont, uh, they will become legends in the sport. But they really, even though not from here, U.S. Open will become known as the place where they really sort of push the envelope in terms of the skill. Uh, this is no Craig Kelly will is one of the most famous snowboarders, and he rode for Sims, which was a California board. Burton grabs him and steals him. Uh, but at the U.S. Open, because of contracts and legalities, uh, he couldn't ride a board that had Sims or Burton markings on. So this was known, it was just an all-black board. And Burton turns this into a great marketing uh, scheme. They call it the Mystery Air. And uh, at the ski show, snow show, the winter sports shows out west, uh, they would just have a crate that said Mystery Air. Nobody, could really, nobody knew what it looked like, but it created this groundswell of people just wanting it, wanting it. It became a great uh, marketing campaign that all stemmed from the fact that he couldn't ride a... Uh, marked forward. The, uh, the half pipe <coughs> is, gonna, is a great event. I've spent many winters uh, up there on the side of uh, the half pipe and uh, watching the uh, snowboarders hit the air. They had an MC, Chris Copley, who started off in marketing at, at Burton and they needed someone to sort of run the event and he said, well I got a loud mouth so I can do it. And uh, all the moves and the riders so during the event uh, as they were going down hitting the different parts of the half pipe he could explain what was going on and tell stories and anecdotes uh, as the event gets larger it's going to uh, his, his skill is going to turn into a lot of enforcement as well there's a lot of snowball fights uh, happening across the half pipe there's a lot of unruliness uh, and so he's going to have to uh, be a little bit of an enforcer as well uh, this picture right here really shows what was so great about the half pipe. You know, here's the, the rider hitting the hit, coming out of it, and high-fiving the fans as they you know, descent back in. It really just showed the intimacy of the sport. You, know, you could go and see your favorite rider, be right there with them, and have contact with them. And not very rarely in a sport do you have that sort of close connection between Editor and the spectator. I mean, you can get down on the, on the Knicks basketball court if you're Spike Lee or someone famous, or, but uh, you're not going to get as close as that. So really, the people just look forward to that. They camp out there all day and just have a, a great time. And there was a lot of beers and backpacks and things like that that definitely contributed to the fun. Uh, Ross Powers, he will get a uh, board for uh, Christmas. Mom works up in the cafeteria up at Bromley, still works there today. Uh, and he will rise just from a little kid to uh, snowboarding uh, on weekends and what have you into a ranked competitor, going through the Allegro program, competing in the Ground Three Mountain Series, going to Stratton Mountain School, and then going to the 98 Olympics, and then the 2002 Olympics where he won gold. Taught by Scott Palmer, who uh, <coughs> Dorset resident. Betsy Shaw will go to Nagano on the left. And uh, 
Ron Quixote will also go to uh, Nagano in 98. This is the inaugural snowboarding event. Didn't go off too well. Uh, the, 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 the Betsy you know, missed the gate. Uh, the, uh, the snowboarders in general were sort of more of a media you know, sideshow. They were making fun of the way they dressed and the way that they talked. And that was really the focus of the coverage at that time, and less about the athleticism. Uh, it was fur further marred. The Canadian who did win the event uh, was tested positive for microscopic amounts of uh, marijuana at the time. And, and the best snowboarder in the world at that time boycotted the Olympics because at that time the, the FIS, which is in tar charge of skiing, controlled snowboarding in the Olympics. And the snowboarders hated that, so a lot of them didn't even participate in the Olympics. So the Olympics got sort of a bumpy, a bumpy uh, coming out party in Nagano. But Ross Powers does win the bronze there, so it isn't, uh, can't take away uh, the successes of that. But he's going to find that in Nagano, he didn't really take advantage of the Olympic uh, experience. They were sequestered off to another little mountain. They didn't do much in terms of the Olympic Village. So when he goes back in 2002, he's going to really take it in. And gold there as well. He's going to get newfound fame, unparalleled in the sport. That is a life-size Lego. I've seen it. It's like that big. All Legos, dolls, action figures, and cover of uh, Frosted Flakes. I asked my son which would he like. He said the uh, action figure is uh, the best one, even though the Lego is pretty impressive. Trisha Burns uh, and Doug Burns. Both locals, weekend warriors. Uh, Trisha will become a U.S. Open uh, champion and then go to the Olympics as well. Doug will rise through the ranks as well, but unfortunately dies from an asthma attack in 1999. Uh, Stratton will pay respect to him by naming the, uh, the skateboard park area after him called East Burnside. And I find it sort of ironic that the trail that the snowboarders took over and they turned into a snowboard park. It used to be called Tink's Link. And that was named after Tink Smith, who was one of the original founders of Stratton. So in the process of paying honor to Doug, they sort of took away the honor that they paid to the earlier skier history. So sort of unbeknownst to him at the time, and it was showing sort of the transition of the sport uh, from skiing to snowboarding in terms of popularity. A lot of mag, uh, sub industries sort of rise up in the area as a result of the growth of snowboarding. Uh, Neil Korn from New Jersey will start Eastern Edge Magazine uh, with headquarters in Bonville and uh, go up and down the East Coast and document snowboarding. He'll also sponsor uh, the annual event at uh, Burn Burton. It was a fundraiser for the skateboard park. And uh, this would really be uh, pro snowboarder versus pro snowboarder, uh, a great event. Andy Coglin, three P champion as coach of uh, of uh, the, the basketball team. Sean Palmer right there, the young kid. Uh, Kurt Dury, another local. Uh, didn't didn't did have some problems though. Jeff Brushy, ranked snowboarder, twisted his ankle in the basketball game. Couldn't compete in the. Uh, official events the uh, next day, so it did go uh, wrong a couple of times. Rue Moscarello, along with J.G. Gernt, uh, will use something from the 70s as well, it's called a bongo board, a little balance board, and you'll see that this can be improved upon and uh, creates voodoo balance boards, which uh, will serve as good training for balance for snowboarders. He'll resurrect the snurfer years later and bring that back as well. Hayes Brothers, uh, they, uh, Steve Hayes will get in a bad accident, snowboarding accident, pretty much destroys his knee, makes a transition, starts his own snowboarding company with his brother Michael and uh, becomes once again taking advantage of that local myth that's going on. The Hayes Brothers were so well known and famous and the board becomes really popular. 
Well, the board is popular. The thing that really puts the Ace Brothers on the map is their basement. And this is the site of many a U.S. Open party throughout the 80s. Uh, this is the one part of uh, my research that people, A, didn't really want to talk about, or B, they just couldn't remember. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I've been to a lot of Hayes Brothers parties, and it was, it was intimidating as a kid uh, going in there and seeing these pro snowboarders having fun. And uh, I would just sort of sit in the corner and observe from, from afar. And a lot of the uh, next generation snowboarders would actually sort of come to the party and, uh, and sort of have a touch with stardom there. Some people equated it to being like on the red carpet at the Oscars, you know, seeing all these famous people there. Uh, the Hayes brothers will continue that when they have their own snowboarding company, but the, their parents' basement just becomes <laughs> way too small for the amount of people, so they're going to have to move the party to uh, more official places like Grizzlies or uh, Hayes up at the mountain. Any common threads in all that pictures? There? Those pictures there. Goggles. We got goggles. <laughs> See anything? Uh, all the hats. I was going to say poppy hats. These are all called little D hats. Mm -hmm. See them around town. I don't have mine with me now, but uh, this is a local hat company made by uh, Cynthia Booth, who's also makes jewelry, and this becomes almost like the unofficial uniform of snowboarding in southern Vermont. Take advantage of the fact snowboarders uh, like it. A lot of snowboarders are wearing them when they're getting their awards, uh, and uh, becomes uh, almost like a little cult thing here in the area. Uh, these guys are known as the Gleeblanders. Uh, they are they get that name from poaching runs, poaching and stealing, uh, going illegally up on uh, the backside of Magic, which is known as Gleeb Mountain. And uh, then they sort of they migrate over to Bromley, and they're all young kids, and uh, they spend the day snowboarding and filming themselves doing tricks, and then they go down to the Burton factory, which they had a retail store there, and it's also kind of a hangout. Uh, people just migrated there, and these kids would migrate there and drink their sun kissed soda and watch themselves on videos. And uh, be somewhat of a pain in the neck to the, uh, the store manager with all these kids just hanging around. Uh, and uh, eventually they'll all work for Burton. Uh, Scott Lenhart uh, will design many snowboards, great artists. Shem Roos will be a photographer. Randy Gattano will become a pro rider. The Lavecchia brothers will all work for uh, Burton in some regard. Um, Jesse Loomis just started a company called, not just, within the last 10 years, Powder Jet Snowboards. It's based up in Peru. Uh, so these are all just kids, and uh, will just their presence and their love of the sport will all lead to uh, positions within the industry. We're going to see a change in the sport, though, and I, I, I'm going to pin it on the Olympics. There's probably a lot of other factors, but the Olympics is really just going to open up the attention on snowboarding. So like the US Open, which is really this sort of fun, intimate environment throughout the 80s and early 90s, uh, it was really just going to take off by the late 90s into the 2000s. And, uh, keg, kegs at the half pipe competition are uh, not a rare sight. Uh, crowds are going to become intense. So you just can't go up there on the side of the fencing and high five your favorite snowboarder anymore. You gotta get there early to do that. Uh, a, an event that would happen after the half pipe, you a lot of drunken people sort of milling about, nothing really to do. They'd go into the uh, Stratton Courtyard where the awards ceremony was, and the, uh, in the beginning, the competitors would go up to their hotel room and throw out goggles and hats and you know, sort of keepsakes. This is uh, Turje Hawkinson from Norway throwing his board out the, out the window, oh, wow. <laughs> which created a little mini riot down there, which you can, you can expect. Uh, once again, the, the growth of research can get you pictures from the other angle. Not the exact same moment, but uh, that's a board about to be launched into the crowd below. Uh, they launched him. Yeah, probably. 
think it's sort of like those old Gettysburg photos where they sort of set it up, posed it a little bit. I don't know if this is a, actually a guy passed out based in the snow or more of a photographic opportunity, but definitely symbolizes what's going on uh, there in the late 90s. Not to mention just the garbage, all the empty bottles. It really turns into something uh, more than the mountain can handle. And sort of the quintessential event that people call the, the sort of the climatic spectator moment of, of snowboarding of the US Open is known as the Cage. It's 1996. Uh, some guys from East Infection Magazine up in Burlington decide they really want to make this the most memorable US Open ever. Uh, so on their way down, they stop over in New Hampshire, go to the liquor store, buy cases of beer, they buy four by fours and chicken wire, and they go up to the mountain, and this is early in the morning. They're stopped by Stratton security, and they quick thinking say, "Oh no, we're setting we're setting up a VIP uh, viewing area for Burton Corporation." They're like, "All right, great. What do you need? We'll help you out." And uh, they build a platform surrounded by chicken wire, and uh, it becomes sort of uh, the fraternity party next to the half pipe. Uh, so there it is. There, these are the competitors. They hike up the half pipe, and there's what's known as the cage. People watching on. And uh, it, by the end of the day, it turns into a crazy event. Competitors even stopping by and taking a swig on their way up before they do their run. <laughs> you can see that today. Uh, halfway through, the two guys who ran the magazine put on their Cookie Monster and uh, Tony the Tiger outfits, put on snowboards and hit the half pipe and they're putting on their own show. And then the thing collapses. And, <laughs> and Sky Chalmers uh, from Weston captured all this moment. I mean, he caught the moment of the chaos of this thing collapsing with the Cookie Monster sort of getting lost in the, I love the Cookie Monster, but just total <laughs> chaos. Luckily, nobody was hurt, uh, but uh, just everyone remembers this as the sort of quintessential moment. This is from uh, 1996, so this is the same year. Uh, this is from Stratton President Bob Freeze, and uh, he was up on the mountain, and after the half pipe, there was usually a band at the base lodge. And so he's up there on the mountain, and he starts hearing uh, obscenities over the loudspeaker. And so he puts on his skis and races down, and literally like unplugs, unplugs the band. And he had to write this letter to uh, to the homeowners, employees, merchants, talking about how it was a great weekend. ESPN coverage and MTV and CBS. But he says, on the negative side, the event brings with it some on hill drinking during the half pipe competitions, a lot of trash, several loud parties, and some fast boarding on our trails. The promoters also brought in a rap band on Sunday that was way off color. Fortunately, we got the band off stage after about 30 minutes, but the damage was done. I hardly apologize. We didn't know or expect it, but probably should have. So the event is just growing bigger than what Stratton can handle. Burton is having a hard time handling this. Uh, like a lot of things sort of in Vermont, things outgrow, uh, outgrow the, the environment. Uh, we also have an event here uh, after, in the late 90s, a whole bunch of European snowboarders. I'm not placing blame on Europeans. But they have a party over at the Stratton Mountain Inn wake up the neighbors, the neighbors call the manager, the manager knocks on the door, the snowboarders basically tell them, tell them to hit the road. Uh, they call the local police, local police show up. Apparently the single local policeman was sort of chased into a closet where he called for backup for there and then finally brought in the uh, reinforcements. Uh, and this became known as the, the melee on the mountain. Uh, had sort of housing problems. So many people coming here and no place to stay. The hotels were booked. No Airbnb back then. These two boys from New Hampshire, they're experienced uh, outdoorsmen. They go and they build a snow cave next to their car in the parking lot. Uh, <coughs> what we didn't anticipate or nobody anticipated <coughs> was a flower in the middle of the night just plowed them over and they dead by the next morning. So we're getting a lot of bad press and unfortunate things happening here. So what Stratton does in the early 2000s is switch 
the half pipe from the Stratton base area over to the Sun Bowl. Isolated area, sort of self-contained. The homeowners can still ski in and out, get into the cafeteria. It doesn't upset the flow of uh, the regular Stratton experience. And the snowboarding can sort of have a <coughs> self-contained environment. But it's never really quite the same. Coinciding with that, you bring in major sponsors. Now there's like security at uh, checkpoints. Uh, it's, still, it's becoming way big. The half pipe itself is becoming enormous. Uh, it's, uh, the sport is just growing a lot bigger than what people sort of grew up here experiencing. 2012, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but for the US Open, they use a historical picture for the poster, same picture on my book, from 1986. They put on these exhibits about the history of the sport and the history of the U.S. Open. And what we didn't know until three months later is that Burton is going to pick it up and move it to Vail. And uh, we have the end of, uh, of the U.S. Open at Stratton. And I might add that by 1993, Burton had moved to Burlington, so their presence here is uh, kind of disappeared. Uh, so it was sort of a swan song with this uh, retrospective uh, element to the event. But at that same time, there is a, a new event that weekend. It's called the Washed Up Cup on Friday. This is all the former pro riders can come and compete. And so you have all these names and these people <coughs> that I've mentioned, Heingartner, Coglin, and Hayes, competing in this competition, allowing uh, these older snowboarders an opportunity to compete. And they compete for the Washed Up Cup, which is in the Mulligan's basement in the, at Stratton. And even though my story kind of ends in 2012, we still have a lot of success in the sport in general. And I, I, it, it's left out from the pages of my book, but it doesn't mean the sport is not growing at an amazing uh, rate. Uh, Ross Powers wins uh, in 2012. 2002 in Salt Lake City, Kelly Clark from the Mount Snow area wins multiple times. Lindsey Jacob Bellis is a Stratton Mountain School student. Uh, Alex Diebold is from Manchester, will win in Sochi. Uh, Danny Cass will win the U.S. Open five times. So this, this, this is, even though my story ends, the story of snowboarding definitely is still going on. And now, that washed up cup. Friday event served as sort of the nucleus or the, the catalyst for what is known as the Vermont Open. So now the U.S. Open might be gone, but now we have the Vermont Open up at Stratton, which uh, still has a washed up cup component so old foot people can come and, uh, and play, uh, compete. And uh, also, what, this, the U.S. Open had gotten so big that it really wasn't open. Like to think that just about anyone can compete, but the Vermont Open is much more open in the sense that anyone can uh, come and compete. And it's uh, it's turning into its own event. It's never going to repeat the U.S. Open, but it's got its uh, its own identity and it's growing. Uh, in general, there's been this sort of nostalgia within the sport. Uh, I think a lot of people have thought that the sport has gone too far advanced too far. Just the tricks that Sean Palmer and these guys are doing in the half pipe is, you can't push the sport much further. Just the amount of flips and turns and twists. Uh, it's almost gotten unattainable in terms of where the sport can go. Uh, my first video that I got in 1982, the, the, the promotional pitch was, all you need is a hill, some warm clothes, and one of our boards, and you can have fun. Was sort of promoted as the uh, the opposite of skiing. You don't need all the skiing equipment to do this. Uh, well, it's now sort of turned into the same thing. So, like Jesse Loomis up in Peru, he's created the powder jet board, uh, handmade out of wood. More emphasis on going out in the woods, back backcountry snowboarding. Uh, also, the nostalgia is also shown for the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum, where locals like Betsy Shaw, the Carpenters. Paul Johnson, Ross Powers are all members of uh, the Vermont Hall of Fame, the Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. And then, if you really want to get a sense of history of the U.S. <coughs> Open, uh, you can't really get it on a slope. In the historic preservation field, we like to use the term uh, sense of place. When you come in 
into a building or into a village or onto a landscape, uh, you feel the history. I know it's a sort of this untangible concept, but when you're on a slope, you're just looking at a whole bunch of white that's been groomed over countless times, and you just don't feel the history of the sport when you're actually on the trail. Uh, but when you go into Mulligan's, you go down those stairs, and uh, there's broken boards up on the walls and stickers, and you just sort of get a feel of uh, what the U.S. Open was to Stratton. So I think it's the closest thing that you have to sort of a uh, historic site besides the mountain itself. And I like this picture. This is a picture taken uh, in the last 20 years. I can't remember when. Uh, it's a wedding up in northern Vermont. And it's uh, Andy Coghlan's wedding, I believe. But at this wedding, all the legends, the pathfinders of snowboarding in Vermont are there. You know, Scott Palmer, the Heingartners, the Coghlans, the Hayses, Susie Ruick, all gathered in one place for this, this picture. And I, I always, I quite, when I think of this picture, I think of this picture, <laughs> which is the jazz legends meeting in uh, New York City for, uh, for a picture. And uh, certainly not the same equating jazz to snowboarding, but I love this idea of, of the, the legends coming together for, for a picture. And uh, I'll end it there. When did the term riding come in? Okay. No, I haven't really started snowboarding. I don't. I, I haven't really done sort of a, uh, a nomenclature sort of <laughs> review of it. I don't know. It's. Uh, I'm trying to think what would have been before that, like snow surfing. I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't know. Do you do it with the equipment in your book at all, um, specifically the boot? Evolution. No, I, that's another thing that I sort of st <coughs> steered clear of was uh, like the moves that you would do in them, like the snowboarding moves, and I stayed away from really the equipment. I think one thing I do talk about is uh, the transition from wood to P-Tex boards and edges, and really, we, it's so easy to say that you know, snowboarder versus skiing, but skiing has a lot to do for snowboarding. It has the infrastructure, the mountain, the chairlifts, the snowmaking, and the skis in terms of having PTEX and uh, edges are very important to the development of snowboarding. But there are times when the early days where you kind of want to have something stiff behind you when you do a backside turn, and they didn't have anything like that. So they were actually cutting up milk cartons and <laughs> drilling them into the back of their bindings and trying to figure out how to uh, make it better. So there's sort of some improv like that. And kids also taking vinyl records and tracing them over the tips of their board to get a more circular effect at the top of the board and then sawing them so they could make, I mean, I don't know why it's better for snowboarding, but uh, apparently it was. So taking their $500 boards and chopping them up. But the next year, the companies would come up come out with a board with that shape. So the, the, the competitors were sort of guiding the, uh, the development of the equipment. Well, and we all started out with, with uh, Sorrells, just wearing s snow boots yeah. and, and no uh, specialized boots or no. anything. I mean, my first ones were Sorrells. When I first worked up at Stratton, you got a had to buy a pair of Sorrells to load the lifts, and that was my snowboard boot. Right. I still use them today, not for snowboarding. And I'll, when it was in the alpine stages, when it was racing, there was a brief period where hard boots were used. And so when I, I could actually get out of my skis and pop right into a snowboard, not changing my boots. Uh, but that that bad's kind of bad too. Oh. But you could do both. You could ski in the morning when it was icy and snowboard in the afternoon when it was soft. Yes? My favorite story from um, the 90s in snowboarding, which I think illustrates the community and camar camaraderie among snowboarders in the area at the time, was um, right before the 98 Olympics. Ross Powers and Betsy Schwann and everyone, they'd already shipped out. <clears throat> but the Manchester Journal ran an interview 
with Ross Power's mom. Um, and one of the things that she revealed in the interview was that she was not going to go to Japan because she didn't. She was a cafeteria worker. She didn't have the excess income to travel to Japan and get tickets to an Olympic event. So some people were very concerned about that in the area, and they created a fund to get her over to see her son win the bronze medal, wow. which I think was great. That's a great story. Yeah. What's all, in 2002, when Ross was competing and he was going through the half pipe, his whole family went out to Salt Lake City, uh, extended family, and when he's, he's hiking up the pipe, he bumps into his mom, and Ross is like, well, Mom, what are you doing later? And she's like, I'm going to the award ceremony. And uh, you know, she knew in her mind, even before Ross did, that he was going to win, and that he's going to go watch her son get the gold medal. But uh, right. he said that the experience of having his family huge difference. And that's also a common thing when like people like Betsy Shaw and Ian Price, they travel the world, but coming back to Stratton, they just loved it. It felt great. Not only were they getting a home cooked meal and maybe seeing their dog, but just the <laughs> feeling of having sort of this local contingent supporting of it. It was like sort of like home field advantage in using sports terms. So the, the power of friends and family is uh, quite prevalent within, within competing. Yes? More than one person has told me, well, you know, the snowboard was invented right there in that house in East Dorset. More than one person. What are they talking about? Who are they referring to? <laughs> the one in East Dorset? Yeah. Is that the one on Bowen Hill? Or? I think it, right there on Medtown Road on the north side. Yeah, I think they're referring to the fact that Jake Carpenter lived in East Dorset. Okay. But okay. certainly not invented there. Okay. Uh, because people out west can claim the invention, and 14th century Turkey could probably claim invention. <laughs> yeah. So to tweak that term, that is the place where Burton Snowboards yeah. grew That's what they're to, talking about. to the levels that it is today. Embryonic stretch. stages of that's a stretch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just a, another aside. Um, I stopped to see Stig Albertson just before I came here today, and Stig was owned Brahmin Mountain for a period, and uh, he was also on the board of the Chittenden Bank, and the Chittenden Bank awarded Jake Burton um, Carpenter his first loan. 